Good morning and welcome to ASGCT's Insight Series. I'm Sarah Shrafiq. I'm an assistant professor at Emory University and currently serving as the chair of ASGCT's trainee committee. Today's topic is finding a good match, landing a perfect position in an international lab. Over the next two hours, early career investigators will share their experiences in transitioning to working for US-based academic institutions. PIs based in the US will talk about the importance of bringing international trainees to their labs. You will learn best practices around finding employment and hiring non-US based PhD students and post uh, doctoral fellows in the US. All questions will be saved and answered during the panel discussion after all five talks. However, you're encouraged to type questions in the Q&A throughout the presentations. Please indicate if your question is for a particular speaker so we can direct the questions appropriately. You may continue to submit questions throughout the panel discussion also. With that, we can start with our first speaker this morning. Um, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Shishit Singh from Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. His current work focuses on improving gene editing tools such as CRISPR-Cas9, talons, and transposons, as well as advanced novel nanoparticles and viral vector mediated gene delivery systems. In addition, we're happy to share that he's currently serving on several ASGCT committees, including the International Committee. He'll be sharing his perspective on international gene editing and gene therapy research. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this Insight Series session. I would like to thank American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy for inviting me to give this presentation. I will be taking you through my research journey with hows and whys of decisions I made during this process. Before starting, I would like to put up this disclaimer that the world map used in this presentation is only for a schematic representation and may not represent actual international boundaries. I will use this map to show how I moved to different places in my endeavor to study genetics for the treatment of genetic diseases. For each place, I will show the location of the place on the map, followed by a few photos to share my experiences of that place, and finally, my research and progress. I will also add details about my decision-making process. My initial education took place in Meerut, India, which is my hometown. On the left is the building of my medical college. And on the right is one of the famous landmarks in Meerut called Amar Jawan Jyoti to celebrate independence of India. After finishing the medical degree, I got an opportunity to join a program for medical doctors to train in interdisciplinary research in Indian Institute, Institute of Technology in Kharagpur, India. Here at Indian Institute of Technology, I learned about biotechnology, medical imaging, physics in medicine and biology, and information technology in medicine. My inter interest in genetics got strengthened. Consequently, I got an opportunity to visit at University of Fukui, where I pursued my master's thesis project. The University of Fukui has a beautiful campus. This photo is next to the lab in the University of Fukui, when first time I encountered so much snow. The University of Fukui is surrounded by mountains, and not too far from the university is this famous Buddhist Eheji temple. During this program, I learned several molecular biology and gene cloning and expression methods. The work during this research led to my master's thesis defense and empowered me with the skills and potent techniques to study function of genes. Thanks, thanks to the guidance and support of several supervisors, Professor Koyal Chaudhary, Professor Mahitosh Mandal from IIT Kharagpur, Professor Sato, Professor Kuroda, Professor Iguchi, Professor Yagi, and Mr. Yoshikawa from University of Fukui, Japan. And I completed this master's program. 
during this master's program i had studied articles re related to zinc finger nuclease technology for gene editing and i started to think of ways i could use these molecules to treat genetic diseases one of the ideas which was taking shape was to use these molecules to treat trinucleotide repeat disorders such as huntington disease in this search my up next opportunity came in pondicherry india this is a place called oroveil or matri mandir in pondicherry this golden globe is a symbol to promote peace and harmony all over the world and people from more than 60 nationalities reside in oroveil pondicherry uh, pondicherry is also famous for its amazing beaches the work in pondicherry was under the leadership of professor chand shegran from johns hopkins professor chand shegran is the inventor of zinc finger nuclease technology he told me that he is developing a project for assembly of new of new genome editors talents at pondicherry biotech private limited in india he offered me position to clone the library for assembly of these molecules consequently i worked on this project and constructed this library i was still interested in pursuing a phd to use genome editors for disease treatment so i sent applications to several places for joining phd programs in gene editing i got a positive response from professor theri venandrish and professor marini chua from free university of brussels in brussels atomium is an iconic attraction and i happen to live within walking distance from it grand place in brussels is on the world heritage list and is known for its decorations and aesthetics if you are in brussels and want to feel festive go there and you are likely to feel cheerful i joined this phd program and started to develop my research to use talents for correcting type 1 myotonic dystrophy during the initial part of this phd i got a chance to delve deeper in genome editing through a genome engineering conference in italy where i got to meet professor keith jung for developing type 1 myotonic dystrophy project additionally i heard about crispr cas9 first time at this conference i immediately thought to use this technology in my phd projects few months down the line we started developing projects around crispr cas9 usage in type 1 myotonic dystrophy and liver specific factor 9 gene targeting this led to several publications related to crispr cas9 applications of crispr cas9 uh, from our lab since 2012 publications using crispr cas9 have risen exponentially and resulted in nobel prize for dr emmanuel charpentier and dr jennifer edorna moreover now with synthetic modifications in crispr cas9 we can also use base editors to correct the point mutations seeing these developments i decided to continue further in this field in 2016 my contract in the free university of brussels was coming to an end and i was looking for positions to continue gene editing research at that time i came in touch with dr james dalman who was a post doctoral fellow in the lab of dr fang zhang dr dalman told me that in the few months he is going to start his nanoparticle delivery lab at the georgia institute of technology in atlanta and he asked if i will be interested i accepted his offer there was some time until joining at georgia tech so i and my wife decided to travel to ecuador also i spent some of this time to develop my ideas and genomic data analysis skills using r and python additionally we explored ecuador and its culture food and famous landmarks like the middle of the world in ecuador Ecuador is also known for its beautiful beaches, gigantic mountains and active volcanoes. During this time our visa to US got finalized and we moved to US. First in Atlanta and then in Philadelphia. 
This is the skyline of Atlanta featuring Georgia Institute of Technology. Georgia Tech is an amazing place for learning, not only due to being at the forefront of the technological advances, but also due to the accessible and inclusive support provided to the students by the Georgia Tech administration. In Georgia Tech Atlanta, I started to develop platforms for the delivery of DNA molecules using microfluidic nanoparticles and built my base how lipid nanoparticles package nucleic acids using microfluidic devices. At Georgia Tech, I also had opportunity of sharing my research to the high school students and their parents. Further, I was interested in pursuing the combination of nanoparticles and gene editing technologies. During this search, I got in touch with Dr. Kiran Musunuru from University of Pennsylvania. I had earlier read some of his, this, some of his gene editing research work. I talked to him about this interest. He suggested that Dr. William H. Parento, who is an attending surgeon at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, is pursuing this line of research. I communicated with Dr. Paranto and I joined his lab at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Here we worked collaboratively with our team on several gene editing projects, which re resulted in several publications. For the development of nanoparticle platform for lung targeting in large animal model, ASGCT funded my research in this field. I gave two presentations at the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy Conference in 2021 for, for our research using nanoparticles for gene editing for the correction of type 1 tyrosinemia mouse model and prenatal gene editing to target lungs in the sheep model. Further, ASGCT also awarded me travel award for this research, although I didn't have a chance to use it yet uh, due to COVID restrictions. In 2021, due to the visa related regulations, I was not able to extend my US stay. So I moved to Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. Kingston is located on the Eastern end of Lake Ontario. And in this photo, the Ontario Lake is located just behind this sign. And Kingston is known for its history and culture. Queen's University is one of the Canada's leading research intensive universities in Canada, where I am pursuing my gene editing and gene therapy research in the lab of Dr. Jagdeep Walia to study correction of neurodegenerative diseases. We have a group of hard work working masters, undergraduate, and PhD students. And together we are executing this research with enthusiasm and passion. Further, I believe that this diverse experience and expertise I have built over last several years in future will help me in bringing these benefits to the patients and their families. I believe that these are the values which have helped me in pursuing my research. Among these, I consider most important are to connect with people around you and keep eyes on long-term goals which motivate us to achieve results in the chosen direction. I am grateful and fortunate to find amazing colleagues, advisors, and friends for guiding and backing me. Importantly, I would like to thank my entire family, my grandparents, parents, sisters, brother, and my wife for their unwavering support. Last but not the least, I appreciate all organizations and universities who have invested and believed in me to pursue these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was an uh, uh, amazing talk on, on your um, international journey uh, thus far. Um, we'll wait for questions until the end. Um, in the meantime, our, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Pradip Bhatkin. 
a postdoctoral fellow at the National uh, Institute of Health. Um, his personal journey through working in many laboratories gives him a unique perspective on transitioning from undergraduate to graduate studies in the United States as an international student. Today, I will be sharing some of my thoughts with you about navigating through graduate school in the United States um, to prepare yourself for a science career. And along the way, I will also share uh, some of my experience as I progress through my own training. So uh, this presentation is mainly geared towards younger trainees who are in their college or are in the early stages of their graduate school. But uh, it might also be helpful to um, um, faculty who might be interested in mentoring international students but may not be aware about some of the processes that are involved in getting the students from their home country to their labs. This is my disclosure slide. Um, I like to clarify that the content uh, in this presentation are my own views and I'm not speaking on behalf of ASGCT or any other organization. So uh, just so you're aware of the perspective I am talking to you from, I would like to briefly introduce uh, myself. I was born uh, in, and raised in Nepal in a small village. And after high school, I came to US and I have stayed here since. I studied molecular biology um, at Brigham Young University in Utah. And after that, I moved to Texas to work as a research assistant at the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy at Baylor College of Medicine. Yeah, I also got my PhD degree from Baylor. And um, I, after that, I moved to uh, Maryland to the National Institutes of Health for my postdoc. And I have been here since uh, the last quarter of 2019. So with that aside, I would like to start uh, uh, and then transition to uh, the, the main component of my presentation. And I want to start by talking about uh, the right time for transition to the United States. Um, international students who join PhD programs in the US uh, mainly come here uh, either like me, who uh, come as college students and then stay on or those who complete their bachelor's or master's degree in their home countries and then come to the U.S. for their PhD. Although both options are possible, um, I think uh, entering the U.S. as a college student has some unique benefits that some students might not have access to if you complete your pre-graduate education in your home country. So to give you an example, um, getting a degree from a U.S. college, uh, it allows you with ample time to get familiar with the U.S. education system, which could be quite different than, um, than what you have in your home country. It was quite different for me. Um, and another advantage is um, you get time to, to deal with, understand, and adjust to the culture and lifestyle in the U.S., which was also quite different for me when I first came to the U.S. And uh, something that might be a little bit more important to students from um, countries where English is not the native language, uh, um, going to college in the U.S. can really help improve English uh, by taking courses as well as by being around and communicating with American peers. So these are all different advantages of, of um, coming to U.S. as a college student. But I think the most important um, advantage is access to research opportunities in the form of on-campus mentored research, as well as uh, internships that you typically do in other institutions outside of the, the college you attend. And uh, some of these research opportunities can uh, have a significant impact on how your career shapes. And, and I think uh, my own uh, training uh, path is a good example of this. And uh, I can uh, tell you, share you the story briefly. So when I was in college, uh, my um, professor who I was working with in the lab at that moment recommended me to this internship program called SMART program at Baylor. And when I went to Baylor, that was the first time I learned about T cells and how you can engineer them to recognize tumor cells. Uh, and I found it quite fascinating. And I still do, because I still work on this field. And uh, 
Um, after the internship, I got invited to work um, for a longer period of time by my summer mentor, and I went back to the same lab and worked as a research assistant for about two years in various projects, and uh, ended up staying for almost uh, four or five years more uh, to get my PhD in the same lab. And uh, during the last year of my PhD, I attended a seminar given by uh, an investigator from NIH. And I found his research quite interesting, so I reached out to him and showed interest in joining his lab as a postdoc. And um, in fact, that's actually what I ended up doing. So uh, to, to sum it up, um, basically doing an internship, um, it doesn't seem like a big decision, but as you can see, um, and taking that advice of my undergraduate mentor, it, it made a, quite a big difference in how my training progressed from that point on. So uh, although there are some big advantages, uh, there are also some drawbacks of uh, coming to U.S. as a college student. The financial cost being the first one, which uh, could be quite significant unless you can obtain scholarships. Um, and uh, another uh, factor that needs to be considered is also that you are going to be away from family and friends um, basically after you finish your high school. So that might be important to some and you, uh, you might need to think about that as well. Now, for uh, those who are finishing their college or, or master's um, in their home countries and then applying to PhD programs in the US, um, there are a few things that you need to consider. Uh, the first one and probably the most important being academic requirements of the school that you're applying to. Although most schools in the US have similar requirements, some might have some special prerequisites for international students. So make sure that you're aware of those. And you also need to um, consider factors like um, if uh, your transcript is not in English, you might need to get it translated. So those are things that you need to think about in, in advance. And if you're from a country where English is not the first or native language, um, like it was in my case, uh, you will probably also have to take English proficiency tests. And uh, also, uh, another important factor to consider is that you need to be able to obtain a student visa, which is um, most likely going to be an F1 student visa uh, for most students. Um, and it is uh, it can be a little bit more complicated uh, right now because of uh, the COVID pandemic, um, since it's also affecting the ways uh, embassies work in different parts of the world. And uh, although not as critical, you also might also uh, want to consider uh, your living situation in the US after you arrive. Things like where you'll be staying, uh, how to get driver's license, opening a bank account. All these things, um, although they seem trivial, sometimes they can take longer than expected. And a graduate school um, gets busy quite quickly. And uh, it's, it's always, um, uh, better to um, be prepared. And if you have any questions, uh, you should seek help from peers, ideally students who attend the same school as you do, but they've been there uh, before you. And although you, you may not know them, you can reach out to the school administrators and, and ask them to put you in touch with uh, uh, one of these students, and, and they might be able to help you guide through some of these processes. So now I want to move on to talk about finding a good match of school, a good mentor, as well as a research project you want to pursue during graduate school. So when it comes to school, I think the most important factor is um, the research and the faculty. And if, if you don't find the research being done at the, the university um, interesting, it's probably not the right fit for you, even though it might be a popular school. And uh, another thing to consider is how the school funds graduate students. Um, these are things like scholarships to cover tuition, stipends, uh, and if there are any requirements for graduate students to um, serve as uh, teaching assistants. So all these things you might want to consider um, and, and find out before you apply or, or decide to join the school. And although not very important, you might want to, want to also consider location of school. 
Um, depending on the environment uh, you're coming from, you might find certain schools or cities more suited to you than others. So now what about identifying the right mentor or the right lab? I think this is the most critical part of deciding where you want to do your PhD training at. Um, and you will get this opportunity during the first year of graduate school, um, during which you rotate through different labs um, for a few weeks. And um, this is a time for the student to understand how the lab operates, what kind of research is done, if you find research projects interesting, especially the one that you might be doing if you come back to the lab as a graduate student. And it is also a good opportunity for the student to know um, the mentor's personality, their uh, way of mentoring students. Uh, and um, on, on, the, on the other side, it's also a good, good time for a mentor to learn about the student, their potential, and find out if they are going to be a good match for their lab. So during this time, you want to make sure that you find the research interesting time. You also want to make sure that the faculty has grants to support you throughout your training. But I think the most important factor to consider is what kind of uh, person the faculty is and what their mentoring style is and if that suits your needs. Um, you can always talk to uh, trainees in the lab and get their opinion and their experience uh, of being in the lab and working with the faculty. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, usually, even though the, the trainees and the lab members are open to sharing what they feel, um, so some might be a little bit hesitant, mainly because of the fear of retaliation. So it's, it's not a bad idea to get a, an outsider opinion by talking to somebody in the same department, but maybe not, not the same, a member of the same lab. So um, the next is basically talking about the research projects you will be pursuing during graduate school. Um, how do you choose one or how do you decide what you work on? Um, in most cases, um, your mentor will probably have some idea um, or a project that they want you to work on, but um, you might have your own ideas as well. And, and a lot of mentors are welcoming of new ideas, so you might end up working on something that's a combination of uh, um, both. But the most important thing is uh, you want uh, the projects you work on to be interesting and exciting uh, enough that you're motivated to, to drive the project uh, during the training. And uh, if it's going to have a significant impact on, on the field of your study, that's even better. But an um, important point to note is that uh, you don't want the quest for high impact project or high impact paper to, to dictate your PhD training. The goal of the training is mainly to learn how to think, do, and communicate science so that it prepares you for the next stage of the career. And that's what I, what, what I think should be the main focus of, of the PhD year should be. So um, before I uh, finish my presentation, I want to briefly go over um, what the overall structure of graduate school uh, looks like in the US and how you can try to maximize your training. Um, so during the first year, it's, it's mostly um, full of coursework and, and the rotations you do to identify uh, a lab that's a good fit for you. And uh, during the second year, um, by this time, you will have already identified a lab. And uh, this is the time to develop a project as well as project proposal. Uh, and to complete uh, qualifying exams, um, which uh, formally um, admits you to uh, the PhD program, or you're considered a PhD candidate after you pass this exam. So different schools have different names for this exam, and they're held um, at different times. But in most cases, I think this, this happens during the second year as a graduate student. And the next few years, you'll spend uh, working on the research projects, uh, collecting data, moving the project forward. And if all goes well, uh, towards um, fourth or fifth year, you are ready to um, approach the finish line um, and you submit the, the papers and start seeking postdoc opportunities at that time. Now, uh, graduate school is going to be quite busy because uh, mainly because of uh, the lab projects that you'll be working on, but, um, but I think uh, 
um, to to maximize the training potential. Uh, depending on what you plan to do after PhD, um, um, you should also take advantage of opportunities like mentoring uh, students. They could be summer interns, um, as well as take opportunities of uh, grant writing courses the university might offer, uh, especially if you plan to have your own lab um, at some point in the future. And a lot of schools um, also have uh, career development offices that can help with um, things like improving your CV, writing uh, job applications, and they also organize um, different workshops and events that uh, you know, might be beneficial um, that, that you might want to look into. Um, and uh, also, during graduate school, um, I, I think um, uh, for, especially for people who want to go to industry in, um, positions, uh, you might want to talk to your advisor or mentor about doing industry internships and uh, seek those out as well. And um, attending seminars and conferences, um, I think these are great platforms to not only share your research and get ideas for new uh, new ideas and learn about what's going on in the field. It's also a very good platform to uh, start building networks, which uh, might actually um, turn into opportunities in the future. So one of the last things I want to focus on is uh, taking advantage of taking opportunities to present. Um, I think um, as international trainees, uh, we, we do ourselves um, uh, disfavor uh, by hesitating to talk science or talking in general, mainly because of language and confidence. But uh, one of the, the most effective ways of overcoming this is just by uh, talking more. So I think this is something that uh, you might want to maybe even force yourself onto in the beginning until um, you get um, yeah, used to it. So uh, with that, um, I would like to end this presentation. Uh, if uh, you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them during the Q&A session. And uh, if you would like, uh, you may also reach me uh, uh, via LinkedIn. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bagan, for sharing your experiences and advice. Um, I know a lot of trainees watching this uh, found that information very helpful. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marina Pavlou, who is currently at the University of Washington working in the field of gene therapy for retinal uh, regeneration um, with a focus on viral vectors for direct reprogramming. She'll discuss some of the challenges and solutions she experienced while transitioning to a postdoctoral position in the US. Uh, welcome everyone to this brief presentation today that I will be giving you about uh, challenges and solutions when transitioning to an American postdoc. Uh, if I may, I wanted to rephrase this a little bit to my thoughts about transitioning to an American postdoc, because of course I can only speak from my own experiences and I hope that this resonates or reflects a little bit to what your reality might be. Um, just a little bit about myself, I wanted to share. My name is uh, Marina Pavlo. I'm Greek Cypriot. I come from this little island in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I've had quite a journey on the move with um, studying my bachelor's uh, in the UK at the University of Sheffield. I stayed in the UK to do my master's in cancer and working on oncolytic gene therapy at UCL. I did a little bit of professional floating right after my master's. I didn't quite know what to do. And I was applying for different positions and experiencing you know, the usual struggle of trying to find a right fit in a right place. And uh, thankfully, after about a year of not really sure what to do and working for companies part-time, I was able to secure a research assistant position uh, at UCL for a year and a half. And then after that, I moved to Germany to do my PhD in reptile uh, gene therapy. And then since the end of my PhD, I moved across the world, at least what feels like across the world to the University of Washington, uh, where about eight months ago, I started my postdoc. 
So uh, moving to the US was quite a big change. And of course, it takes a while to master a new system. Uh, as you can imagine, there are many aspects of life that one needs to get used to again when there is such a huge uh, difference. Things like the culture itself and subculture, subcultures, um, the language, of course, uh, verbal and nonverbal. There's a lot of things about the body language, the way in which people communicate that is beyond just the language itself that one needs to get used to. Um, changing the housing situation and of course you know what is available and what you will find might be quite different from what you're used to the infrastructure itself the way the city is built um, the cuisine the foods you know what is you know going to the groceries might just be a, um, a whole new adventure for you uh, the currency might change uh, literally and figuratively <laughs> you might see that you know the things that people give value to differs quite a lot from what uh, you're used to and from where you're from. The legislation is different, the bureaucracy is different. And uh, if you double that, uh, these are also things that you will need to figure out uh, when it comes to academia. The, the, the US academia is its own little cosmos where you will have many of these uh, similar aspects to get used to again. And, uh, you know, factoring in also your own ambitions, your own expectations and career prospects that you hope to, to achieve while being here. Some thoughts uh, in advance of applying um, that has personally helped me. I would say it, it's always good to reflect first before you venture into applying for a postdoc. Why are you doing this? Why uh, are you interested in pursuing a postdoc in the US? What are your priorities and what are you prepared to invest and for how long? The answers to all of these questions are going to guide you in all your different pursuits of the teams, the universities, the cities where you're going to be. And it's, I think, an important step before you start. Um, it's important, of course, to ask, you know, reach out to the people that you know with questions, even to people you don't know, like alumni from uh, either groups that you have participated in or groups that you want to join. Um, people you might trust, the re departmental representatives. There's a lot of people out there that I think um, more or less would be, of course, willing to, to share their insight. And it's important that you communicate your needs and your aspirations, because if you don't say it, then you're not giving people the chance to fulfill them. Uh, of course, it's important to prepare, you know, and play to your strengths. If you know what you're good at, format your approach according to what you're good at. If, for example, you're better at, you know, spontaneous interactions with people and you're less uh, good at putting your thoughts down in a very structured way, maybe it's better to try to meet people in person or to try to arrange a, you know, a virtual meeting where you get to speak with another person versus if you would rather you know, not be as confrontational and you would prefer to have the time and space to prepare your thoughts and write them down and uh, have everything in a concise space, then it might be better that you do your communications mostly online. So that awareness is gonna help, of course. And it's important to understand the limitations that you might have, and if possible, or if needed, make some improvements. Like, of course, uh, having good language skills is important. It's great, and it has helped me a lot to work on enunciation. Uh, if people cannot understand what you're saying, of course, they cannot evaluate where you're coming from and what you have to bring. Presence, presentation skills, visual cues, and public speaking experience will always help when you're trying to make your case about, hi, this is me, this is what I have to bring to the table. And it, I think it would help in this context as well. When approaching uh, prospective groups, my suggestion is to first give it some time. Uh, you need to contact groups six to nine months in advance, I think, because of course it takes quite a bit uh, for the interview process. Maybe you have to visit the lab and you know, give yourself enough time ahead because transitioning to the US requires also a visa uh, that the application process might take some time. And of course, moving countries is a big adventure that you need to give yourself the, the time and the space for. Um, you need to screen the groups, the perspective groups and the interactions that you will build during your interview process, of course. 
um, it's good to know, are there other international group members or alumni? Um, what is the job description uh, of the postdoc here in the US? Are there any differences to what you understand a postdoc is supposed to do um, in the country or in the system that you're coming from? Um, is the interaction going to be online only? Unfortunately, with the ongoing situation, it might be that you can only have a virtual interview process. So um, I think it's great to ask for a virtual tour of the space, of the lab itself, and maybe also a, a virtual happy hour to get to meet everyone that you're going to be working, uh, working with. Sorry. And of course, uh, talk to admin early, early on, because you need to know what you need to prepare for in terms of paperwork as early as possible. And remember that this is a two-way interview. You need to find the right group for you. And remember that you're choosing them as much as they are choosing you. So there needs to be you know, this, this exchange of, hi, I'm here, I'm taking a big step to come to a new continent, a new country. Uh, adapt to a new system and I want to make sure that the space I'm coming to is welcoming and nurturing and accepting of where I'm coming from as well. Um, in Greek we say uh, which is a phrase I really love which essentially broadly translates to there is greater impact when you get straight to the point. So when you are interacting with people and talking with people I think it's always best to to get to the point. And this has been something that has helped me a lot when uh, interacting with groups here in the US. And I, I felt was quite welcomed as an, as an approach as well. Um, consider that you might need these. Uh, of course, um, in cases where you have obtained your PhD somewhere else or your doctorate title might be different. Like for example, in Germany, the title that I received uh, finishing my studies is Doctor Rerum Naturalium, which is a, a Latin term for this person has received the PhD in natural sciences. But it can be that you might require a confirmation from the university that yes, this doctoral title is equivalent to the PhD here in the US. Um, you might need to translate your certificates and academic transcripts in English, and it's always good to do this in advance. Uh, if you're traveling with family, you might need to translate a birth certificate or a marriage certificate in English, and that's going to be definitely useful, especially if they're coming on a, on a dependent visa on yours, so that's going to be important to have. Um, you might need an accessible mailing address outside the US most probably, so if you have family or friends that you can trust, maybe you can use their address um, as, a, as an accessible address outside of the US while you are here. Um, you're going to need a valid passport for the duration of your visa, which is something that I, I personally actually need to, need to uh, work on now that I'm renewing my visa, so keep that in mind. And uh, there might be some specific requirements for having an international health insurance before you can travel to the US. So that's just something also to have in mind. Um, my suggestion is also community is everything really. So um, other internationals are your allies. Um, and the same way that you might receive some help uh, coming into this country, help newcomers uh, when you can to settle in as well. Um, tailor the postdoc to yourself, uh, and of course, use all the resources here. There is a huge breadth of wonderful resources that you can get uh, through the university, through the societies that you're participating, like the ASGCT, you know, through the conferences that you might be exposed to here that have a different format than what you might be used to in your uh, country of origin. So really make the most of this. Um, and remember to go where you are wanted. Uh, it's, it's important to know that there is a match, both from your side and from the lab, that accepts you that to do your postdoc. There needs to be both an agreement that, yes, we have a match, we understand each other. You know the, uh, let's say, the, the differences of, of the background that I'm bringing in with me. Or if you're not aware of them, you're open to take them into consideration. And I think this is... Uh, really foundational to a great experience in both sides that is both productive, professional and positive. And uh, finally, I would suggest to you know, protect yourself and others. Being an international in a country where your stay here is visa dependent, 
um, does not mean that you have that you are in any inferior position. It's it's a procedure that we of course have to go through, and the same is true for people from the U.S. when they want to uh, travel and work and study in other countries. So. If we just understand that it's a process, then it becomes less of a power play. And it's it's great to have that uh, in mind as well when approaching people and being aware of it is a good mechanism of self-protection and protecting your community as well. And finally, uh, my, my take home message is enjoy the journey. I mean, uh, the world is your oyster as cliche as that might sound. Um, but I really think that uh, it's a wonderful experience to do your uh, postdoc here in the US. There's a lot of things to learn, new school of thought, new, um, new creative process. So um, you know, take that all in and by all means, feel free to, uh, to reach out if you have any questions and uh, if there is anything I can help with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pavlou, for that great presentation. Um, now that we've heard from early career investigators on their unique experiences, we'll pivot to talks from US-based PIs. Um, first, we have Dr. Ma uh, Matt Porteous um, that will share, and he will share with us the values of recruiting international students to American labs. Dr. Porteous is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University. His research focuses on developing genome editing by homologous recombination as curative therapy for children with genetic diseases. Um, he also sees patients at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital where he um, uh, uh, takes care of pediatric patients under, undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. All right, hello and uh, good morning. And thank you for the invitation to uh, give a perspective as a lab PI about the value of recruiting international trainees to American labs as part of this workshop. Um, and I've included here the uh, uh, flag picture that was uh, as part of the announcement. So um, I will first start out with saying that my lab has uh, benefited tremendously from having trainees with international backgrounds. And it was a really fun opportunity to find a map of the world and start uh, putting little dots uh, from all the countries for, uh, from which people in my lab uh, have, have come from. Um, and uh, first of all, it was quite exciting to see all the different places, but it also made me realize, hmm, there's still some places that uh, I need to get trainees from. Uh, so uh, look forward to, to filling out my, my global map uh, in the future. Um, so there's, I, I believe there's multiple reasons uh, that you'd want to build a lab with international trainees. Um, and I think, and I'm going to go through uh, uh, some of these over the next couple of slides. The first reason is, is uh, an issue of fairness. Since in, in, in the cell and gene therapy field, we're designing therapies that will treat patients with diseases. Um, and these patients are all over the world. There's a global impact of these diseases. I think it is only fair that our trainees reflect that global distribution. And so that even if we run uh, academic labs or labs in the United States, it is, I think, as I said, fair that we include um, trainees internationally who can actually reflect uh, those parts of the world uh, where patients are also from. Second point is, there's an enormous amount of talent all over the world. And if you uh, artificially exclude recruiting people into your lab from different parts of the world, of course, you are limiting the ability to bring in, uh, bring in that talent and tapping into that talent. And unfortunately, it has been my experience that there's still countries um, for which there is enormous talent, energy, and enthusiasm that are uh, still not able to access the global uh, biomedical research community in an effective way, especially in uh, stem cell, gene therapy, and cellular therapies. So that is something um, that we hope can change, but really involves uh, politics, which is way above uh, my expertise or pay grade. Um, this third reason um, is that bringing in international trainees, I think, increases your probability of success. Um, I think there is evidence that 
when you're tackling hard research problems, which I think we're all trying to do, that those are best solved when you bring in a diverse, a diverse set of perspectives to solve uh, those problems. And I think when you bring people uh, into your lab from an international background, you are bringing in uh, a diversity of perspectives. And that diversity of perspectives, I think it will increase your probability of success. Um, that is that some you may see a challenging problem from one direction and it's almost impossible to solve. Somebody can see it from a different perspective and that becomes your path uh, to a solution. And so again, bringing people in with different perspectives increases your probability of success. The fourth uh, reason is this issue of um, taking on research problems that with unmet medical need or unmet research needs. I believe it is natural, uh, a natural uh, characteristic of all humans to study the problems that one is aware of and interested in. But we are blind, every human is blind and biased to certain types of problems. And by bringing in international trainees and listening to them and their perspectives, I have found that it often opens my own eyes to important and interesting problems that I previously did not recognize. And so one can establish innovation in your own lab by studying important problems that other people have not even recognized are important. And international trainees can help one identify such uh, novel and important problems. And from a selfish perspective, uh, there's the issue of seeding. If I bring in uh, trainees from all over the world and uh, a, a good fraction of them will return uh, to their original homes, um, I will have been able to seed those parts of the world with the technology approach and ideas that have come from my research program. And I think by doing so, you have increased um, the probability uh, that uh, you, you, your, your, your approach to solving difficult problems uh, will generate more momentum. So um, the Scott Page uh, has written at least two books and many others have as well that have, uh, to me, really uh, proven that how diversity can enhance uh, the success of a research program. He was not writing about uh, academic labs uh, specifically. He was writing about teams uh, broadly, um, but I found uh, his writing to be very compelling and provide experimental basis to this uh, instinctual gut feeling of the importance of diversity. And so I uh, post the title page or the covers of, of two recent books. Well, the difference isn't that recent. The diversity bonus is a, a little bit more recent for, uh, um, your, for your information. The other um, reason that I think looking for trainees uh, from an international background is important is that there are general care qualities that I think we all look for. And these include uh, intelligence, people being smart and being able to um, absorb and uh, a large amount of information, often quite complicated information. We're looking for uh, people in our lab who are creative and innovative in, in how they think about uh, problems. We want people who are collaborative and know how to work well with others. We want people who have either demonstrated uh, leadership or have demonstrated the potential to become leaders in the field. We want uh, people who, when they take on a project, they take responsibility and ownership for the project. And finally, we're all looking, or most of us are looking for people who demonstrate drive and ambition. And I was thinking about this uh, this morning that um, anyone who is willing to move their life uh, and sometimes their entire family's life around the world in order to do a, a postdoctoral fellowship or undergraduate school have demonstrated a drive and ambition. Uh, it's an objective measure of their drive and ambition that they're willing to uh, move around the world or across the world or thousands of miles in order uh, to, to get training in the United States. And so it, it, it's, it's a check mark uh, for me anytime. Uh, somebody comes from outside the United States is they've already demonstrated that uh, that personal trait. 
there are some challenges to recruiting international trainees. Um, and while the US is uh, has uh, tremendous resources for biomedical research, research comp particularly compared to um, other parts of the world and countries, we actually do not have unlimited space and resources. So if you reach out, and this is really more directed at internet, uh, potential international trainees, which means that when you reach out to a lab and you don't uh, receive a positive response, it may be simply a fact that that lab currently does not have the space or resources, resources to take you on. And so you should not take that personally, but instead um, continue to look broadly for the best uh, environment for you to continue in the next stage of your training. One of the things I have encountered is that in different parts of the world, PhD programs admit students in different ways. In the US, uh, many uh, universities have umbrella PhD programs and you apply uh, directly to the PhD program rather than to the lab itself. And it is only once you uh, gain admission to the program, do you have the opportunity then to join the lab. So as you explore which page PhD programs uh, you might be interested in, please uh, do the research about sort of what's the process for admission. Um, I know at Stanford and when I was at UT Southwestern, uh, we, uh, all these PhD programs have a pathway for international uh, trainees uh, to gain admission. Um, of course, postdoctoral fellowships basically act uh, as a direct application. Um, another challenge is, is that often uh, PIs might not have the knowledge of your institution or lab or in the environment that you come from. And so educating the PI um, to where you're coming from and what you have accomplished is an important way to gain attention. And of course, publications um, and the quality of the publications is an objective measure for people all around the world to assess your success. Another challenge for recruiting international trainees into US labs is, is that unfortunately, uh, international trainees are not always eligible for many of the funding mechanisms we can support our graduate students and postdocs um, who come from the United States. You thus increase uh, your probability of having many, many doors open if you're able to uh, approach a PI with funding in hand, uh, even partial funding, or even if it's for the short term, it, it, it definitely opens doors. And then finally, as you're all aware, is, is that uh, visa issues can become an issue, uh, can, can also uh, prove a barrier to recruiting international trainees. Most institutions have support uh, for uh, trainee visas, but the more uh, a trainee can bring to the table, uh, again, the easier it is in being able to recruit an international uh, uh, trainee to, to one's lab. The other thing that is very important for me, and I think others, when we're uh, trying to evaluate um, whether we should bring somebody from another part of the world into our lab is the issue of communication. Um, in my lab, I want everyone to be able to communicate freely, openly, um, and in an effective fashion. And since we work in English, uh, unfortunately, we need to see that trainees have the ability to both write clearly in English um, and so that when you reach out to a potential uh, new PI, that first email should be concise, be written clearly and personally, and not be generic. I can tell you that if I get an email saying, dear professor, um, and doesn't even include my name, uh, I will immediately delete it because it does not show that the person has done any uh, specific uh, work to identify why my lab might be the right place for them. And then the person should be able to communicate verbally in English comfortably. And as I mentioned, this is important because it enables collaboration with other lab members and other labs that your, your lab may be um, uh, part of. I have had actually colleagues of mine who have come from other countries and I thought their English was uh, perfectly uh, fine, but they uh, felt like they needed to improve it and so took uh, classes to improve their English. Um, so that is uh, a, a, an additional uh, barrier 
but I really want to be quite frank that um, we want people in our lab who can communicate well uh, in English um, so that uh, they integrate and collaborate effectively in our lab. So finally, uh, I'm listing a lot of the people who have uh, currently in my lab and my collaborators. And so I hope you can, as you read through some of the names uh, and some of the institutions they come from, you can recognize that in my own personal uh, research environment in ecology, there's a large variety and it has been extremely important. And uh, for me, and I think an extreme, an, an element of why uh, we've had success in our research program because of uh, this diversity um, in our in our collaborations and who works in our lab. So I look forward to the question and answer session, and I hope I've given you uh, some of the reasons why I believe it's so important to have an international uh, presence in one's academic lab. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Porteous. That, uh, I think that talk was very helpful and informative for, I think, PIs and, and trainees. Um, finally, uh, our last speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rainier Brenchens. Uh, Dr. Brenchens is currently the Deputy Director and Chair of Medicine at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, he's recognized as one of the most influential and accomplished figures in the field of cellular immunotherapy, and he'll share his insights into how to identify the right fit for PIs and trainees. So good morning, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to give a talk on something I usually don't talk about, and that is uh, finding a good match, landing a perfect position in an international lab. And um, I think that much of this is based on my experiences as the PI of a laboratory, wherein um, we've had a multitude of international trainees. and. Uh, I guess this, for the next 15 minutes or so, I will impart some of the wisdom uh, that I've gotten over the 20 plus years that uh, I've been a laboratory PI. So first of all, these are my conflicts of interest. So just to give a background on, on what my perspective is uh, uh, as the PI, uh, we started uh, developing at Sloan Kettering when I was there um, technology designed to enhance the ability of a patient's own T cells to be able to eradicate uh, uh, cancer. And that is done through the introduction of a Frankenstein-like molecule, which is made up of part of a, a binding domain of an antibody to a target antigen on the tumor cell surface. And that's then fused to the signaling domain of a, uh, uh, of a T cell receptor. And this Chimeric gene can then be introduced into retro or lentiviruses, um, and a patient's own T cells can be activated. The gene can be introduced, and now you have what we call a CAR or chimeric antigen receptor T cell that now has been re educated to recognize targets on the surface of a tumor cell. And we very early on, uh, two decades ago, were initially focused on targeting the uh, protein CD19. And CD19 is a target that's expressed on normal B cells from your immune system, um, uh, but more significantly is also uh, expressed on a variety of different types of tumors, including acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, B cell lymphomas, and chronic leukemias as well. Even a subset of myelomas uh, have been reported to express CD19. More significantly, it's not expressed on stem cells. So if you generate a population of T cells that are targeted to recognize CD19, the risk of ablating the bone marrow um, is, uh, is minimal. And over the years uh, in the laboratory, we came up with uh, different iterations of these types of receptors. And as you can see to your left, this is the first, what we call a first generation 
uh, chimeric antigen receptor, which contains just the signaling domain of the T cell receptor. And we started evolving that into uh, a second generation CAR, which expresses um, both the signaling domain of a uh, co-stimulatory receptor, such as CD28 or 41BB, and again, the T cell receptor uh, signaling domain, the zeta chain of the T cell receptor. We and others have looked at third generation CARs, but really the ones that have evolved in the clinic are these second generation CARs that contain this CD28 or, 4, or 41BB uh, co-stimulatory signaling domain. So one receptor, two signals. And when we translated this to the clinical setting, you can see here, these were the first five patients that we ever treated um, on, uh, on this protocol. These are all patients with B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And as you can see in the red box, five out of five patients that were heavily refractory to other treatments um, developed uh, a minimal residual disease negative complete remission. So that was actually very promising. And work in the lab uh, since that time has been to utilize this platform to uh, target other types of tumors, including solid tumor malignancies, as well as, for example, multimyeloma and other hematologic malignancies. We overall treated 52 patients on this uh, clinical trial. And as you can see, the complete remission rate was really quite high in this highly refractory patient population. 85% of patients um, achieved a complete remission with these CAR T cells. And this technology has since been developed uh, by industry and is now FDA approved for patients with a variety of B cell cancers. Um, and more recently with multiple myeloma, which actually is also um, derived from B cells. So that is, is my background. And over the years that I've been the PI of the lab, um, I've had a uh, significant number of trainees that were not born in the United States. And I should add parenthetically that I wasn't born in the United States. Um, I came here at a very young age, but I was born in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And so I guess in that sense, I am a uh, foreign uh, investigator as well. But I think the first thing that has to be remembered from the perspective of, of a PI who's looking to hire postdocs is it's not a level playing field. And I suspect that most anyone that is listening to this uh, presentation is aware that uh, obviously it's much more difficult if you got your post, if you got your graduate training outside of the U.S. to uh, be able to land a uh, position as a postdoc here in the U.S. And that's because uh, within the country there are multitudes of uh, people looking for postgraduate positions that come from U.S. Uh, or even Canadian uh, graduate schools. These um, young investigators come from labs that are familiar likely to the PI of the lab that hires them. And that is not necessarily an advantage um, that is shared by those who got their training outside of the US. And it is also important to recognize, which I'm sure is also appreciated, is that not all international postdoc candidates are in fact created equal um, in the eyes of investigators, whether this is fair or not, um, um, it likely isn't. But again, um, international postdocs can come from Europe, from laboratories that, again, are familiar, whose work is familiar by the PI that may be looking for a postdoc, um, as opposed to other laboratories in other countries um, where um, the uh, laboratory itself may not have be as prominent, um, which, again, begs the question of what lab uh, did you get your graduate training in? Uh, who was the PI? Again, familiarity is, is something that, that um, many um, PIs look for, um, knowing the quality of the work that was done at a particular lab. If they've never heard of the uh, mentor um, from which the candidate graduated from or obtained his PhD from, that again is, is an issue for, um, uh, for, for the PI um, in, in the states looking for an international postdoc. And there's also issues um, about where the graduate student, where your graduate work has been published. And again, fair or unfair, um, in many uh, established laboratories with known PIs, it's much more likely that your graduate work will be published in a journal that has a higher impact factor, that is more familiar. And it's more likely that um, the work that you did for your graduate uh, uh, studies 
um, may have already been read by, by either the PI or someone in uh, his or her laboratory. So how do you best get a position coming from the outside of the United States trying to be uh, establish yourself as a postdoc in the United States? Well, the first answer is, I don't know. Uh, it is very difficult. Um, I think that there are a multitude of resources that you could potentially scour to look for laboratories that may be looking for, for candidates such as yourself. The first is to really look through social media. Um, that includes Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, many times when, post, when PIs are looking for postdocs, they will uh, advertise in social media. It's free and uh, it's highly convenient. And um, we recently, having just moved to Roswell Park here um, in Buffalo, New York, we recently utilized uh, the social media to put out uh, uh, an advertisement and we've gotten multiple um, responses and many of them from uh, foreign graduates. If you do attend some of the national meetings, that's a great opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with certain PIs. That gives you a great free interview as it were um, with these investigators or even with their own postdocs or other folks working in their laboratory to gauge interest and to potentially say a little bit about yourself um, to, to spur interest from uh, that uh, PI. Um, I have gotten over the years a multitude of emails from, uh, from people looking uh, to work in my lab um, as a foreign uh, graduate. That is uh, obviously uh, one approach that you can try, but it's very much hit and miss. And as the investigator becomes more established and access to postdocs from other competing labs, for example, um, it becomes less and less likely that these investigators will actually even open those emails. I probably open about 30 or 40% that, uh, that I receive, um, and yet that is still an opportunity. So I would absolutely not discourage uh, this approach, which I think has been used by, by, by many who have successfully uh, obtained postdoctoral positions here in the United States. And then the last point on how best to get a position is just persistence. I mean, you need to get your foot in the door and uh, you need to just keep trying. A single email to a particular lab that you think you're ideally suited to um, is, uh, is probably insufficient. Uh, many PIs, including myself, get hundreds of emails a day and we just don't have the time to, to open every one. So uh, doing, sending out emails um, is, um, is, is a good idea. When you do send out an email, make sure that, that uh, you have someone, make sure that the English is proper because again, there's something that, that we find um, that, that could easily disqualify you if, if the language isn't proper. And so as best as you can, um, make sure that the, the email uh, reads comprehensively um, and, uh, and certainly looks more personalized than if it was just a, a bulk email that was sent to say, dear doctor, and nothing more than that. It just gives the indication that um, this postdoc is sending out emails to just about everyone. If you personalize it a bit and include a couple of lines of the work that you might be interested in doing in that PAI's lab, um, then an email can be much more effective um, than if it's just a bulk uh, email sent out. So trying to put myself in, in, in the shoes of, of a foreign graduate, what's the strategy that I would use? Well, I think the most important thing uh, coming to the United States and establishing yourself in the United States is you need to get your foot in the door. And as I said earlier, that requires a great degree of diligence, scouring social media, sending out emails and trying to interact as much as possible with PIs from, uh, from laboratories in the United States. Of course, it's always attractive to go for a, a, a more senior PI, um, but that is actually extremely difficult. Um, as you can imagine, the more senior uh, you become uh, as a PI, the more attractive you are to uh, some of the top flight or top established uh, graduate schools here in the United States, laboratories that, 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 that the PI may have collaborated with or is, is aware of their work. And so if there's one thing that I would try to uh, give advice here is that, and this is based on my own personal experience as well, is that 
probably your best chance of getting your ver proverbial foot in the door is to look for junior faculty. Junior faculty tend not to be as attractive for American born graduates as, as a site for their postdoc. Um, they have uh, a far more difficult time finding um, uh, people to work in their labs. And so it's much more likely sending an email to someone. If, for example, you see on social media that Dr. Such and So uh, just got uh, awarded their own laboratory and is looking for, for, for postdocs and graduate students, that is a perfect um, uh, target for, for, for you because. Again, the number of applicants are going to be lower to those junior faculty uh, labs. And there are actually additional advantages because these junior faculty tend to have more time. And if you are the, a postdoc in, a more, uh, in the laboratory of a more senior uh, faculty member, you may find yourself um, being trained not necessarily by the PI. In fact, you may not have a lot of time, face time with that PI. But the junior faculty, they have more time, they're more eager to train, and so that is actually very much an ideal setting. Um, I think that this has probably been touched upon, but, but um, many of the foreign trainees that I've had um, came into the lab through, through graduate programs, and that is certainly, maybe not for this audience, I'm not sure, but that's certainly an easier um, way to establish yourself um, in uh, US-based laboratories. When you do get a get a, get an interview, you need to be prepared. You have one shot at trying to impress people, and that means when I say be prepared, be prepared to to have a good slide deck that will represent your previous work. But more importantly, um, make sure that you have done your background research on the, the the PI of the laboratory that you're applying to, and indicate that you're actually familiar with the work that is being done there. It's very possible, and I say here, be flexible that the laboratory that you want to working on won't necessarily be working on uh, the subject matter for which you got your PhD. And so you have to demonstrate uh, knowledge in a field that you may not necessarily have been familiar with or trained in in your graduate work um, and um, show that, that you have some competence discussing and asking questions about the subject matter that the PI is working on. Once you're in, Again, one thing that is very important um, working in, 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 in the laboratories in the United States is your visa status. That is critically important. Um, it is a, an added burden to the PI if they decide to bring you into the lab and then have to spend time and money to get you a proper visa so that you can work in the laboratory. The more you can do and the more ready you can be to move into that laboratory, the more attractive you will be to, to uh, PIs in the United States. Your first postdoc will likely be your hardest, and that is because the, there is going to, you're going to have to learn um, a lot of new techniques, more than likely. You're going to have to learn the, a new cultural system of how laboratories run, and that can vary from, from PI to PI. Um, but if you're successful in that first um, postdoctoral position, and when I say successful, I mean that, that the data looks good, that you get some uh, good publications, a second postdoc becomes a lot easier because then you've become a known product. What that means is that, that uh, the next postdoc that you look for, the PIs are familiar with the laboratory, hopefully are familiar with the laboratory where you work, they're familiar with the work that you've done, et cetera, et cetera. So you become instantly more attractive because you become a known product, which is not the case when you first come uh, into the United States and potentially came from a lab that may not be known to uh, investigators or to many investigators in the United States. Another thing that I, I think um, is worth mentioning is, uh, and, and this is just from my own experience, multiple short stints in various labs doesn't look good. It suggests that, 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 that either you have issues with uh, uh, with with other members of the laboratory, you have issues with um, uh, other PIs, um, and that you don't kind of stick to your guns and finish a project uh, properly. Oftentimes, however, there will be short stints because the, the PI of the laboratory runs out of funding, et cetera. So make sure that if you have a short stint or do, do a short postdoc of a year or less, that you can explain that to, to whomever the PI is uh, of the laboratory that you're next applying to. 
Now, I want to illustrate this um, kind of in the context of, of, of some of the uh, international trainings I've had. And as you will see here, um, a recurring theme here is that many of the uh, uh, many of the trainees I've had already managed to get their proverbial foot in the door, and um, and I hired them um, for their second postdoctoral position. And 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 as you can see on the list here, um, uh, we've had a variety of of international people from Russia, from Australia. China, Germany, Brazil, India, Pakistan, Korea, and my home country, the Netherlands. Um, but if you look through the list uh, uh, quite critically, uh, you can see that many of the international uh, postdocs that I've had in my laboratory were um, postdocs that were coming from other US laboratories and were, were their second stop uh, in the process. So again, the emphasis here is is the fact that that once you've done a postdoc in in in, uh, in, in an American laboratory, you, you become a much better known product, and the risk factor to the PI of of, of an unknown product, uh, as it were, um, gets significantly minimized. And so again, the emphasis here is get into a lab and then transferring to to other labs or doing second postdocs or even third postdocs becomes remarkably easier, especially if you've been successful in your prior um, uh, work in your prior laboratories. So what is it from the, the, the PI's perspective? Well, there's no doubt that some of our finest scientists that are currently PIs of laboratories in the United States are foreign graduates, and that's not surprising. And the fact of the matter is that for many of the postdocs that make it to the United States, they're the best and the brightest from, from whichever country they came from. From a PI's perspective, it's hard to make an assessment, especially if they come from laboratories and do work that, that, that the PI may not be familiar with. And so for the PI, it's high risk, but it's also extremely high reward. And I emphasize that because it's not just the, 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 the knowledge base and, and the skill set that the, that the candidate may come with, but by the merely, by definition almost, uh, these are extremely, you guys are extremely highly motivated and ambitious scientists. Otherwise, uh, you wouldn't have made it as far uh, as to, to, to be looking for, for postdoctoral positions uh, in the United States. Now, again, from the standpoint of the principal investigator, it's hard to make judgments in certain situations of what the qualifications are or how qualified the, the candidates are. Oftentimes, there's limitations because uh, uh, the, the, the candidate may come from poorly funded laboratories where the uh, equipment and the technology may be limiting. So it, it, there are very few objective measures that the PI can use to assess what the skill set is of that uh, of the candidate, but again, as I pointed out earlier, that your first postdoc is going to be the hardest, and there will be a lot of very steep learning curve to acquire for some candidates to acquire the skill sets necessary to be successful in the first postdoc and to get a good position in the second postdoc. Um, <clears throat> And again, from the perspective of the PI, just to reiterate, candidates may require significant most, uh, more training, especially in that first postdoctoral position that they obtain um, here in the United States. I'll emphasize this again, visa issues may be an impediment, and that's also very important um, because oftentimes, uh, you know, a PI just doesn't either have the, the resources, the institution may not have the resources or the time to, to go through a lengthy process to obtain a work visa. Um, for a candidate to, to work in their lab. And then finally, and I put a question mark next to this, there are communication barriers. Um, it is important in your uh, interactions and your communication, especially by email, for example, with uh, uh, potential laboratories um, that, that uh, it be written in, in as understandable and explicit language as possible. It's, it shows an attention to detail. And again, it shows a commitment and, and a likelihood that you'll be able to fit in to, um, uh, to a PI's particular laboratory. And I think I will stop there. And I'd be happy to answer any questions.
So it's good. Thank you, Dr. Brunchens, um, and for to all the speakers for their wonderful talks. Um, so we do have some questions coming in, and so I'll just get started. Um, the first question is, how has the pandemic affected international trainees and PIs that have international people in their labs? Um, uh, Dr. Pablo, maybe you can start um, with that, and then we can open it up. Mm -hmm, sure. So uh, I was recruited actually during uh, 2021 when the pandemic was still at large, uh, uh, well, one could argue up until now still. Um, so it was quite a different recruitment process, I guess, from what the usual uh, procedure would be, which is to, of course, first reach out uh, to the PI per email. And then um, instead of being invited to the lab to present uh, my work and to meet the lab, meet the PI and discuss the potential of collaboration, um, it was all done virtually. This meant that we had a series of meetings where uh, I held the presentation in the department uh, virtually, of course, uh, to showcase my background and discuss the specifics of my interest in the, in the different labs that I was applying to at the time. And this was done for all of the applications that I did, independent of location and also in the US. Um, take note that the time difference might be uh, quite painful, uh, potentially, depending on where you're from, but that's something to keep in mind that you may likely have to be flexible in that regard when it comes to meeting the, the, the time period that the lab that you're interviewing with is available. That could be in the evening or early in the morning of uh, where you're from. Um, but last but not least, in terms of visas, uh, visa requirements, this was not different because of the pandemic. The only difference was applying for a national interest exemption, which was required uh, for, uh, I don't know for how long exactly, but it was a requirement for at least a year, I think, for individuals that were to come to the US. In addition to them having a valid visa, it was necessary that the university issued them or their sponsor issues them a national interest exemption that allowed them to then come on a specialized case uh, to the US. As far as I know, this is now no longer a requirement. However, uh, there is a way is, is the main message that the universities are usually either outsourcing um, uh, visa application procedures to bodies that do this professionally, or they have a specialized department that will guide you as to how to do this. But there is a path uh, to follow. And I'll just follow up with that. Did you feel like you got a good sense of the lab or the labs that you interviewed or how, how did you um, you know, discern between groups when you were interviewing? And do you think, you know, coming to a place, did you actually get a good um, idea of what it was like there? So I have to say that it really helped to have the extra virtual tours. Uh, so I, I was really happy to have, uh, you know, time allocated to me that was outside of the interviews. That was a series of, I think, five hours, four or five hours, you know, to talk to each individual member in addition to the presentation. So that was lengthy and kind of matched what it would be like to be there in person, uh, at least in terms of length. Then in terms of interaction, I think um, the, the best or the most helpful for me to gauge the groups that I was interviewing with was um, speaking to the individual lab members uh, a little bit longer. And the fact that if the lab, lab members that I was interviewing with were willing to give me a little extra time of day, you know, to talk also on a more informal level, that significantly helped the interaction. And of course, when the PI also put, you know, repetitively, maybe like a 15 minute time slot to talk to me more than once, this was also a good sign for me to say, okay, there is a back and forth. There is a common ground here that we can build on. It was not just a one-off and then I don't speak to the person again. That's harder to grasp, you know, what is our relationship gonna be like as a PI and as a trainee? So um, having more interactions, even if they're shorter, 
can really help. Great. Um, do you do you, do the other panelists have any input on what their um, how the pandemic has affected Dr. Singh? I know you talked a little bit about having to leave your lab due to the pandemic in your talk. Yeah. So at the time, like at the beginning of 2021, when I moved, uh, so the only difference which I found was uh, uh, it took a little bit more time. So I think if you are you want to move to another lab, just give a more time for your visa processing and so on. So that takes a lot of time. Apart from that, most of the inter interviews which we give these days for like me joining international labs, uh, they, those will be virtual interviews. So that is not much of a difference. So only thing difference is just give ample time and uh, communicate well with uh, potential peers. Great. Um, so we have another question, um, uh, and this is geared toward the PIs. Um, how do you, how does a PI navigate their academic institution if there are significant hurdles to hiring international people in their labs? Yeah, should I start and then Rainier, you can go. First of all, I thought it was uh, great to see the common threads through all the presentations and I, I learned a lot, but I was particularly struck that Rainier's and my thoughts were almost identical, just said in different ways. There's no uh, collusion. Yeah, we, we had no idea. Um, just going back to the prior question, I think the pandemic has uh, inhibited the ability to recruit international trainees. Um, I personally would probably never... Uh, I, I've now learned that hiring somebody without meeting them in person is not a good approach for both sides. Um, but hopefully this is uh, something we'll look back on and um, it, moving forward, it'll be less of a problem. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, how does a PI uh, help? Um, I will say another thing that was a barrier to me was our pr prior uh, president putting barriers in place for visas for certain uh, people. Now those have been reversed as well, but that was a particular problem with a, a postdoc of mine who I really wanted to join the lab, but um, uh, was a citizen of Venezuela. And it just was really complicated to delay things significantly, but eventually she made it. So that was good. Um, you know, I don't think uh, there are, um, you know, I can't change Stanford's policies on visas. So I can't, I can only work with within what the university has already established as policies. There's not really a way to, for me to work around their policies. I am fortunate to work with a fantastic admin who knows how to maximize what we can do within those policies, but I can't change them. So uh, I don't know, um, if there are significant hurdles at the institution, there's not much an individual PI can do, but you certainly, if you have a talented admin, you can at least figure out what is possible. Um, yeah, so don't expect your PI to be able to change their university policies. It's just it's just not possible. Maybe Rainier in his new position can change policy, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been asked to, but I, I too have, have a, an outstanding administrator, um, which, which is, is uh, I'm sure Matt would agree with me. Um, having people that have worked with you for 10 years, they know all, all the ropes. And, and there are certainly things that we can do on our end to help move a visa uh, process yeah. forward. But again, that has limitations. And, and you know, if, you're, if you're quite junior and looking at a postdoc, and, and I have three candidates, one of which has no visa issues and the other two that do, and, and um, I feel equally about all three. I, I take the one without the, the visa issues. Um, and so I think your comment, Matt, to get as much done before you, you apply and to make it as, as, as painless as possible um, is, 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 a, is a big thing. Um, I'm not quite sure what the policies here are at Roswell Park. I just I, I'm not, haven't been here long enough. Yeah. I do recall at one point we actually had a very attractive candidate from uh, from Iran that we tried to get in, and it simply ultimately after months of trying and ultimately failed. Um, I guess we're, we're we're not good friends with the Iranians, so um, yeah, that yeah. doesn't that doesn't help. Um, but but yeah, I mean, do as much as you can beforehand, and 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 you know, don't take it personally if ultimately um, it's the 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 candidate that has their visa issues figured out 
uh, that gets picked over one that doesn't. Yeah, just so you know, for I, I, Stanford will not sponsor. Um, geez, I always forget the names, but you know, your green card if you're a postdoc. Um, yeah. So don't expect that um, from many U.S. institutions. Great. Um, so I think the next question can kind of be open to everyone because you can have perspectives from both sides. But um, when applying for a postdoc, what should an email to a PI include to be appealing? So you, maybe um, the early career investigators can talk about what they wrote and then the PIs can talk about what appeals to them when they see. Yeah, uh, I can go ahead with it if it's OK. So, yeah, so usually when I write emails, first of all, I will write dear professor, the name of the professor. And then after that, uh, uh, I will include a statement like uh, a general statement, like hope you are doing well. So, so just to establish an acquaintance, acquaintance kind of. And after that, I will start including, the, uh, I will state uh, the reason for contacting a statement about that. And then uh, say, uh, say something which uh, I know about the lab of the potential PI. And then I will state three of my important skills which can contribute to the lab of the PI. After that, I will briefly give uh, my background. And uh, then in the end, last statement about uh, uh, what can I potentially bring to the lab of the PI and, uh, and give a statement about uh, uh, hopefully I can contribute to your lab and uh, such statements and uh, give my contact information in the last statement as well. So it's easy for the PI to contact me back. And uh, yeah, so best regards, so and so. And uh, yeah, just include my contact details at the end of the email also, so that uh, in case PI prints the email, all the contact in information is there and attached my CV with the email. So that's the usually I do when I contact potential peers. I've actually had a slightly different approach <laughs> and I find it very interesting to hear this because I found that at least in, in my experience, the longer the email, the worse the outcome. It has always helped me to keep it as short as possible to the point. Of course, you know, the appropriate greetings of dear professor, dear doctor, the, the name of the person. And then I agree absolutely with saying, you know, um, the reason why you're contacting the PI and what it is that you're looking for. Um, I find that in order for me to share, uh, you know, the extensive details of where I'm coming from, I like to just attach my CV and indicate that, you know, I have, you know, a background in topics one, two, three, and uh, please feel free to see my CV for all the extensive um, details. Make sure that in your CV, you include a publication section of the things that you have published, because I think that helps, you know, already to have, you know, very clearly stated, these are my achievements. If you've acquired funding or if you've participated, you know, in an organizational manner in any way that is demonstrated, you know, skill, soft skills as well, put that in your CV, because I think that's sort of the bread and butter for a PI to see, okay, this is what this person has to bring. And of course, include what I think within two sentences is sufficient of why do you wanna work with them? What do you have to bring and what do you wanna work with them? I find most insightful or I was inspired by if you truly were, of course, which I hope is the reason why you're contacting them. You know, I, I found this, work that you did most inspiring or most uh, crucial. Um, and I see myself, you know, contributing to this by blah, blah, blah. Um, I look forward to, you know, if you have more to say, I would suggest attaching a cover letter because in your cover letter, you can go on in more depth if you want. And then the PI has the choice to click on it and say, okay, I have time now to read this, I'll read it. But otherwise, keep it as short as possible as a clinker of, hi, this is me. And then, you know, the niceness of, of course, you know, greetings and hope to hear from you soon. And if you need to reach out, these are my details. And that's it. Yeah, I, 
I, I agree with both. I think probably they actually agree with each other that the the topics um, that uh, Kashit's uh, mentioned are important, but I absolutely agree with Marina. One or two sentences at most for each topic. As Rainier said, we get too many emails to spend a lot of time. I want to get a sense of immediately. I, I love the statement for, in Greek about getting to the point makes things most efficient or something most productive. That's what you want in that email. And totally agree on the two attachments, a CV that is one to three pages in length, where it's easy to find your education and funding and potential uh, and, and papers, and then a cover letter. I think a cover letter shows professionalism. Um, and as, uh, as was pointed out, it gives you a chance to expand. Um, and then finally, you know, and I think it was brought up a, uh, look, I understand if you're applying to 20 labs, it might be hard to personalize every email, but you need to, um, and there can be core components that are shared, but there needs to be some evidence that you know what our lab does and how your skill set. And saying my background uh, would fit well into your lab is not specific enough. It has to be my background in analytic chemistry really could fit well with your research program in developing guide RNAs to enhance uh, gene editing. Um, put it, put the specifics together for us. And and I can add to that. Look. <clears throat> We get hundreds of emails a day, um, yeah. so I, I would say that that if you don't hear back, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, there's no harm in in, in sending it again because what, you know if, if if Tuesday's busy and you send it on Tuesday, you know I'm on to Wednesday and 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 maybe I have some time off. The other thing is is true, um, at least from my perspective. I if the CV is attached, I immediately click on the CV because the CV says so much about you, your productivity, et cetera. And if you're asking what I look to, I mean, just like Matt, I go look at funding, but I also look at manuscripts and, and I'm not interested in middle author publications. You really wanna emphasize the first author publications. That's what I look for. If I don't see a first author publication, that's usually um, a bad sign. Yeah, one more thing yeah. I, I, I might like Yes. Okay. Sorry, sorry, you go ahead. Dr. Bajkin, you go ahead. I will go later. Okay. So one thing I would like to add is when I was uh, looking for postdoc positions, one thing I mentioned in my emails to the PI was uh, in the end, basically, I would ask if they would be interested in having a phone conversation or maybe a brief Zoom meeting to talk about the research uh, book, what they are doing, and, and in my own experience. And um, Almost none of them uh, said no, and actually I was able to get a brief phone uh, meeting uh, fairly quickly, and that really helped us um, both the PI and also for me to uh, to figure out if uh, we actually wanted to schedule an in-person interview and, uh, where I would go and give a presentation at their lab in front of their, their lab or maybe the department as well. I know, I know you're going to say something, but I want to add one more thing in your email a statement about when you anticipate wanting to start your postdoc is really important because I know I may have no space now, but I might have space in a year and it totally dials me into whether there's any opportunity here at all. Um, and again, I would like to start in six months, but I'm flexible is fine, but at least I know you're thinking six months, not three months or not 12 months. Sorry. So I wanted to add that uh, maybe email is not the best way to communicate with the PI. So find opportunities like uh, in the conference. So if you are presenting a poster there, or even if just going to a conference, uh, ask potential PIs that maybe they can come to look at your poster or uh, make uh, network with other PIs and uh, other graduate or postdocs, postdocs uh, and make this connection. And, uh, or if you read some papers, make connections by emailing about the paper, ask some questions. So these type of connections have really helped me to get from one level to another. So I think it's really important to make some kind of personal correction before, before applying to the postdocs by email or something like that. Yep. So that has really helped me in progressing actually. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would emphasize, you know, meeting up with potential lab PIs face-to-face uh, -face, um, really gives you a unique opportunity to make a very good first impression. Um, a face-to-face -face meeting is, is, is often a lot more powerful than an email. I mean, that's not always possible, but, 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 but certainly um, if you do have the opportunity to travel to, to, to national, international meetings, um, you know, be on the prowl. I mean, find, find those PIs and, and, and realize that you have a good shot there. Yeah, and, and that is where the pandemic has hurt because our yeah. uh, number of face-to-face -face meetings has disappeared essentially. And because I agree, I, I'll just say from personal experience, um, you know, we're often pretty busy at meetings and are always late to things. So introduce yourself, you know, your background um, and say, I'm, you know, I'd like to talk to you more, but don't be discouraged if I say, great, uh, send me an email and let's follow up. That may be all I have time for right then. I might not have time for um, a 30 minute conversation or even a 30 minute coffee, even at that meeting. But at least you have walked up to me, introduced yourself, told me who you are. And then when I get your email, I know where that's coming from. And you can start with, I'm following up on our brief conversation, you know, at this. And now it's like, aha, that's coming from that person. And I owe that person a little bit more attention. Yeah, last, you know, last poster session of the day when they're giving out the beer and pretzels, that's a key time because that's when, when, when a lot of the PIs like to socialize a bit. Yeah. Um, I was actually curious as a follow-up to the question that was asked, uh, where does the panel stand on the importance of reference letters? Uh, even if you don't know the PI that the person that is applying is coming from, how important is it to already include that in either your email or, you know, bringing them up uh, and what they're known for when you're interacting with a prospective PI. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I have a standardized process, which I think it's very important to have a standardized process because it doesn't equalize the playing field, but it might more, you know, e makes it more equal. So if I get an email and the CV looks intriguing and the timing looks right, I will email back and say, can we set up a brief phone call? And if the brief phone call goes okay, I will end with a phone call saying, okay, the next step is I need you to send two letters of reference, one from your PI and one from your choice. And if those look good, then I will say, we'll coordinate a, a visit, you know, hopefully we'll be in person. So that's my process. Um, I don't need those letters with the first email. Um, because I would, I want to see the letters directed to me as well, um, you know. So that that's my process. Uh, I'm sure they're slightly different, but probably pretty similar. Yeah, nothing to add to that. I can add something to here. So I can add something to it, like. So uh, many times, like uh, I have worked in many labs, so different PIs may have different approaches. Yeah. So in, so in some labs, like if I was able to meet the PI beforehand, then they don't care about the reference letter so much. Uh, I can like, to, they, it is just a formality to complete the uh, hiring process. And uh, many times some PIs require your current su supervisors uh, reference letter. So that's a must to include, and it should be good, obviously. Uh, otherwise, uh, the hiring process may stop for you. And yeah, so different. there might be different approaches for different PIs. Just go according to the requirements of the lab. Yeah, it's just interesting because different countries have different, like different systems, different individuals. I have noticed at least that uh, you know, moving from one lab to the next, it can sometimes be that you, you don't have a reference letter from the lab that you're currently working in yet, uh, or from your previous PI, you might have a more generic reference letter that you can provide. And then of course, you know, if you give just the email address of, you know, these are the people that would be happy to support my application and uh, I can reach out to them to, you know, to send you information has, worked but I, I guess it's very you know tailoring it a little bit to the to the pi that you're looking for jo you're looking to join matters is that okay to ask in an interview because that's something that i'm i'm curious about myself 
Well, I'm going to say I had a, the very first lab I worked in, the PI told me he never responded to the first inquiry. He always waited to the second. And that was his way of screening for people who were truly interested. So it goes to, uh, again, Rainier's point that if you don't get a response to the first, don't worry, follow up in a week or two, not the next day. Uh, you know, that that's, but but follow up. Um, I don't use that policy, but I, I, I think it's not a bad policy. Um, but related to that, um, when I asked for letters, I asked the um, person to solicit them on my behalf and have them sent directly to me. Again, it's a little test to show their motivation to get that done. Instead of putting the work on me to solicit letters, it's on them to get the letters sent to me. Um, and it just saves a bit of time, but it also uh, gives, it's a, again, it's a little test. <laughs> Great, and I think we have uh, about five minutes left and maybe I'll ask um, one question that I thought was sort of a theme through some of the talks and which was um, starting early as an international trainee. And so Pradip, maybe you can talk a little bit about what do you think is the most significant hurdle in starting you know, a college in the US or, or um, as an international student? Sure. Um, like I mentioned in the talk, I think starting early on certainly helps in many ways, uh, especially you get used to the U.S. environment, the education system, how school work. And I, I think uh, the main advantage is being able to get engaged in research early on. Um, like I can give you my own example. If I had stayed back home and did an undergrad, I wouldn't have been able to do any internships because we basically don't have any good research labs. The only that's available are hospital labs that process patient samples. And I saw a pipette you know, for the first time when I went to a hospital. I had no idea what that was at that time. The second time I saw it was in a microbiology lab when I was in college. So um, I, I think there are some very unique advantages of um, going to college in the, in the US, but um, um, cost is, um, we all know that US colleges are not cheap. So unless you can uh, get a good scholarship to cover tuition mainly, I think um, it, it's, it's manageable to cover living expenses by working part-time. That's actually what I did during college. Um, but um, if you can figure out a way to cover the academic costs uh, through scholarships and grants, um, starting early on definitely helps a lot. And uh, it, it helps a lot to learn English also. Um, so I never really spoke English as much back home, um, although most of the high school courses were taught in English. Um, speaking wasn't really a requirement. And uh, I actually started speaking when I came to US. I was almost forced to speak because, um, well, that's the only way to communicate to professors, to your classmates, to your roommates, to anybody. So um, I think um, it is actually a good thing to uh, start early on, but uh, it's not always the, the right or possible option for everybody. Um, I think it really depends on the personal circumstances. So that's something that certainly needs to be considered. Great. Um, so are there any other last minute comments or advice that we can give before we close? Okay. Just feel free to reach out also to, at least for me, I volunteer to, um, I would be happy to, to give some thoughts, um, you know, in any way that I can, that I can help, please feel free to, to reach out. The society is more than willing to, to, to help and act as a, as a, as a platform for learning and providing information. So uh, do use all the resources available and don't be afraid to reach out to alumni, to people in the lab, to anyone that you know, information is power. <laughs> <laughs> and also people in the society, which I've found helps a lot too. You know, if you reach out to admin people within the ASGCT, I've found that, you know, they're extremely helpful and want to help in any way that they can. So I would definitely um, advise trainees to do that too. Um, okay, so um, thank you uh, everyone for attending the ASGCT Insight Series. I feel like we've had some really great discussions today and I wanna do a, um, again, give a special thanks to our speakers for their time.
Um, this event was recorded and will be available on demand on ASGCT's website. Um, also, please mark your calendars for the next event in the series, which is AAV Vector Design on February 16th at 1 p.m. Central Time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.